Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. Oh, it's by your grace that we come. We're undeserved, but yet you call. Call us to come. You said, come, all who are thirsty and drink. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are thirsty this morning. God, move about your house this morning as we worship you in your house. God, we pray that it would be glorifying you, exalting to you in all that we do. Heavenly Father, lead us now in your word, Lord God. Teach us, Lord God, that we would hear from you. Encourage us, Heavenly Father, to walk in those things. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And all his children said, amen. All right. You may be seated. Thank you. Praise God. It is good to be back. And uh, just a couple of things before we get started. Um, Sandy and I uh, sat in a church parking lot and listened to the message here. Uh, last Sunday, and we're very thankful for you, Bobby, and um, you did a great job with the Word of God. And, and in that, too, I just want you to know that the Word of God from this place went out beyond that. Uh, Jim Ouellette, our, our elder, taught at First Baptist in Mansfield, and he did an outstanding job there. It was very meaningful to their congregation. I'm very thankful for you as well, Jimbo. And um, so just a couple things. Uh, if you've got the bulletin in front of you, uh, there are two things that are not in the bulletin. One is um, there's a gal here that we love deeply, and her name is Marie, and it's her birthday today. We just want to say happy birthday, Marie. And also that on, on Easter morning, there's gonna, they're doing a sunrise um, up on the Blue Hills. A walk and a, on top of Blue Hills will be a devotional time. If you're interested in that, see Jim Ouellette and Julie, and they'll give you all the times that they're going up if you're interested. Um, they'd love to have you. Other than that, this Holy Week or Passion Week, what, however you view this in the church calendar, we are having two additional services this week, and we'd love for you to come. Uh, on Thursday night, uh, we're calling it the Upper Room, but it's the Passover to the New Covenant. We're going to share the Passover. It's not going to be a full meal, but you will dabble in the elements. And Jesus longed to share the Passover with his disciples. We want to bring you there. We want to bring you there, and then the Lord's Supper, we will be breaking bread that evening. Then on Good Friday, that service will be at 6 o'clock. So it's still light out. It'll only be an hour service, we promise. A Good Friday uh, at 6 o'clock. Uh, Elder uh, Jim Ouellette is going to be coming and giving our service, uh, our Good Friday service. It is finished from the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And we're very excited about that as well, as the price that Christ paid for us is God's dis dispensation of grace for you. So we want to celebrate that together Thursday night, Friday night, and then obviously we're going to celebrate on, on Easter, the res, on the resurrection of our Lord. And that'll be a normal service at um, 1030. So, uh, it's interesting that uh, after listening to the message and then the text that I was reading through, even when I was in Florida, of, of uh, the idea of the law and all those things. And it went back and forth, circumcision and law. But I really want you to understand, remember that this letter was written to the church. So there was Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians. So you wonder, like, what is really Paul trying to uncover? And then, and then he begins in the text that I'm dealing with today, uh, where it says, what advantage is there to be a Jew? But really, when we're talking about this, the bigger picture here is when they're talking about circumcision and the law, they're talking about the promises of God. They're talking about covenants with God. Are these things important? How could God use circumstances in people's lives for his glory? Does that change the glory of God or the power of God? No. It makes me think of, there's a story, I don't know how many. Uh, you might have read it in your history books if you're younger, or I know there might be some in the room today that would remember the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And you wonder how God, something so drastic, 
what could God do with that? What could be an advantage to the United States of America with the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Well, I don't know if you've ever read any of the stories because after that it was called the Doolittle Raid where uh, men stepped up and volunteered after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. They stepped up and volunteered on a mission that they knew that they would not come back from. At least fly back. Because everything that they needed to do, they only had so much fuel on the planes at those times, they could not make it back from where they had to launch from because they were going to go into the heart of Tokyo and they were going to drop a bomb to say the United States is not going to put up with what they did in Pearl Harbor. So what advantage could it be? You think about things like this. Well, there was a gentleman that flew in that raid, the Doolittle raid, and I, I'll never forget it because we were down in Florida, I don't know how many years ago, but I know Sandy's father was alive then, where they were actually celebrating the last gentleman who flew in the Doolittle raid uh, had passed away. He was living in Florida at the time. But there was a gentleman named Jacob DeSazer, D-E-S-H-A-Z-E-R. You'd love to hear his story. But he became a prisoner of war. He had to eject from his airplane, and he became a prisoner of war to Japan. And they brutally uh, persecuted the American soldiers that did what they did. They hungered them. They put them in isolation. They did all these things to them. And, and it was getting to a point, some they executed, but they didn't him. And um, uh, they did starve them. One problem the Japanese didn't realize what was going to happen with all of this because of the isolation is the soldiers started to go stir crazy. Um, the loneliness and the isolation. So th they had decided that they were going to find some books and allow the soldiers, even the prisoners of war, to read because read stimulates your mind. Isn't it great when we can read the Word of God that He can stimulate us to Him? But uh, so one of the books was a Bible. And what they would do is circulate it. And these people mistreated this man, Jacob, so much. And they would say, it's like he would come up to get his food to the cell, and they would take the cell, and it was that heavy cast iron, and they would drag it into his foot. And it was like, you know, he had a hatred. He had a deep, deep hatred for the Japanese people. And then one day, it was his turn, he gets the Bible. And he starts reading the Bible. And God starts doing something in him. Jesus said... Love your enemies. Not just love them. Love them 70 times 7. Like, do the math. We probably haven't even done a fraction of that to enemies. And then he just kept reading. But he became thirsty for the word of God. He kept reading and reading and reading. And then he realized that God convicted him. That he used to love these people. So they used to come every morning and give him a little morsel of food and they would do all the things with the door they would hurt him and they would do all these things he started in his own strength but God just started building a strength in him and he would smile at him and he said thank you he started saying thank you thank you and and he didn't want to give up the bible but he had to give it up to other soldiers and then finally the bible would get back to him and he would never want to give it up I only share this story with you because this man, Jacob, became born again in the cell as a captive, as a prisoner. What a picture. Jesus said, I've come to set the captives free. He took what was hate, what a worldly hate could do to someone, and he took it. And God changed him to love the persecu his persecutors. And God moved in him. He, be, he got married, he got rescued, and he turned and he went back to Japan to be a missionary for God. It's quite the story. You can read about him. Um, it, it's an amazing story. I share this with you because sometimes in our circumstances, even in our church circumstances, we could run into things. We'd say, what is the advantage? Why? Why? Why God? We start these why God, why God? Instead of opening up our eyes to what God might be doing. You know, I thank God what I went through. 
over three years ago that he brought me here. I thank God for that now. I might not have been so thankful three and a half years ago, but I am, or four years ago, but I am thankful now. The advantage, and that's what this scripture is all about. The other thing that I would like to say is simply this, is that, you know, a lot of questions are going to be answered. And, and you know, the questions that might have been going on in the Jewish Christians' minds with the text that Bobby covered. Two verses really stuck with me. Verse 28 of chapter 2 and 29. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man but from God. That really stuck with me, and it helped me enter into the text this morning. So if you would stand with me, we're going to look at chapter 3. We're only going to look at a few verses, 1 through 8. I think that will definitely be enough for us this morning, and we are going to be leading into breaking bread together, communion, this morning. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. You can open up your Bibles. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Then, what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone who were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some, may, some people slanderously charge us with saying their con- condemnation is just. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray, teach us this morning. We, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, and you may be seated. So the title of my message wasn't very creative. It was The Advantage. And here's the big idea this morning. You want to write this down. It's this, salvation is not a reward of the righteous, but a gift to the guilty. Salvation is not a reward of the righteous, but a gift to the guilty. And I have four headings this morning that I'd like to walk through. And the first one is about the advantage of heritage and history. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, then what advantage has a Jew or what is the value of circumcision? I want to say that as I was reading this text, there's four groups of questions. There's four groups of answers, like a QA and a session. Paul's having a QA and a session with the church in Rome. He's producing questions that he knows that are on the hearts and the mind of the people, and he wants to answer them. It could be that it stirred up in them and he heard about them, but he wants to answer them clearly. So I got this thought when I was sitting on the couch in Florida. I said, how many people go to church today that have questions about God and never get them answered? So I said, Sandy, what do you think? Do you think we should have a QA and a here? She said, boy, that sounds like a great idea. And then I'm on a texting Bobby and Jim because I know Bobby's working and he's probably on a big piece of equipment. And I'm texting Bobby and Jim and I said, hey, what do you think? Would you be willing to hear questions from the congregation and biblically answer them for people? And they said, yes. I'm excited about this. But here's my question to you. Is this something you'd want? Awesome. So this is what I'd want you to do. We're going to do it some Sunday evening, by the way. 
okay? We'll do a Q&A. What I want you to do, you can start today, all the weeks up to it. I don't know when we're going to do this. Probably early in the month of May is my guess. But what I want you to do is I want you to write your questions in. Write them on the connection cards or your prayers, whatever, you, and write them and turn them in. And we're going to have a moderator. And a moderator will be asking the questions to Bobby, myself, and Jim. And by the grace of God, we will answer them biblically and soundly for everyone. And listen, it just doesn't have to be about Romans chapter 3 or Romans chapter 2. It could be about Romans chapter 9. I don't know. It could be another biblical question. And, but we would love to answer them. What we want to do is equip you in your faith. And sometimes we could walk away and not having an understanding and I got to tell you, on any given Sunday, you hear from the Word of God, and you walk away, and you say, you know something? I just don't understand this. Boy, I hope you text me. I hope you email me. I hope you email Jim or Bobby, because you deserve your answer. The Bible's clear, and the Bible's true. Amen? Amen. So that's good to know. And I'm glad that uh, we would have this opportunity to do this and answer the question. So... The question was, what advantage has the Jew, since Bobby had already talked about the law, and if you're breaking the law, what good is it? Or if you're circumcision, and you're sinning, and you're turning away from God, it is uncircumcision. So what is, what's behind all this? What is the advantage of the Jew, or the value of circumcision? Circumcision was the mark of the covenant of God. What advantage is being God's people, God's chosen people, and under the seal of circumcision marked by God. The Apostle Paul answers this way, much in every way. He says, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. That means the Bible. That means the word of the prophets. This letter going to the church would provide for them some really, really strong questions and answers that help them walk in their faith. And within the scriptures itself, I want to bring up there's a tension. You're going to need to write this down. The tension in the scriptures this morning on one side is the covenants and the promises of God to what reality and history has said about their past. Is God, what advantage is there to be a Jew? So there's this tension within the scriptures, and we'll explain them out this morning. Because if you looked at their history, and their heritage and their history, you'd have to say, if you read the same Old Testament that I read, that it's a tragic, tragic story. It should involve slavery. Hardships, warfare, persecution, slander, captivity, dispersion, and even in humiliation. This was their life. Is there any advantage to be a Jew? There were menial slaves in Egypt for some 400 years. You can read that in Exodus chapter 1. After God delivered them miraculously from Egypt... They were sent wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until an entire generation had passed away. This is their life. Joshua chapter 5 verses 2 and 8 says that they were sent there because they broke a covenant with God. And if you remember when he came down with the tablets, the stone tablets, they had made, a, they had made an idol, a golden calf. And, and what God did is he sent scorpions to the Jews, and, and he, they were biting them, the scorpions, and they were dying. And the people, over 100,000, had passed away. And they're saying, what do we do? And, and Moses being the mediator between God and man, and, and he went back. And, and so what did God say? God, raise up in the desert one for me, a serpent. And as they look upon now, even though they're going to be bit, they look upon that, they'll be healed. What a picture of Christ for you. But this was, this was their history. God himself killed over 100,000. 
What advantage is there to be a Jew? They broke covenant with God. Even when they had crossed the Jordan into the promised land by the leadership of uh, Joshua and behind the Ark of the Covenant, they had to fight to keep the land, to get the land, and to protect the land. Remember Achan as he kept things that God told him not to take. Judgment of God came upon him and his family and his livestock. God killed them all in front of the nation of Israel. This is their history. After several hundred years, there was a civil war that divided uh, the nation of Israel. The sin of Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 11. 9 through 11, you can read it on your own. Which led to the sin of Jeroboam. The northern kingdom, the ten the tribes there, eventually was almost decimated by the Assyrians. There was a re- remnant kept in that country for slavery. Second Kings chapter 17 and 18. Later, we re- read in the Old Testament that the southern kingdom of Judah were conquered and exiled to Babylon for 70 years. After which some were allowed to return to Palestine. Second Chronicles 36, 15 to 23. You can read their history. You can read the minds of these people. What advantage is there really to be a Jew? Not long after that, they, built, they rebuilt their homeland. They were conquered by Greece. Antius Ephanes, which I'm probably killing his name. He came and he desecrated the temple. He corrupted their sacrifices. He slaughtered their priests. From 319 B.C. to 302, the power had changed seven times. And in 175 B.C., the Greeks started to build the temples to non-Jewish deities, which is known as the Hellenistic era. Remember in, in Acts when, when Paul and he came, and even in Ephesus, where there were just monuments of all these deities, these Greek deities. This is called the Hellenistic era. This is part of their past. And under Rome, they fared no better. Tens of thousands of Jewish rebels were publicly crucified under Herod the Great. Remember in the Old Testament, what, I mean in the New Testament, when Jesus was born, scores of male Jewish uh, babies were slaughtered because of his insane jealousy of Jesus Christ. That's in Go- Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 16 and 18. This is the history of the Jew. In 70 AD, the Roman general Titus Vespian carried out Caesar's order to utterly destroy Jerusalem, its temple, and most of its citizens. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, over a million Jews of all ages were mercilessly killed, and some 100,000 who survived were sold, uh, sold into slavery or sent to Rome to die as entertainment in the gladi- gladiator games. So I just ask you a question. God's chosen people, what advantage is it to be a Jew? Well, on the other side within this tension... The Apostle Paul says much in every way. The other part of this tension is about God's people, God's covenant, and God's promise. And there's countless scriptures, and I'm just going to give you a couple. Exodus 19.6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's God's promise to Israel. Deuteronomy 14.2, you are a holy people to the Lord God, and the Lord has chosen you to be the people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. This is God's promise. Isaiah 43, the prophet in verse 21 says this, the people who I formed for myself will declare my praise. This is exactly what the apostle Peter was writing in his first epistle. To the dispersed Christian Jews in 1 Peter chapter 2. That they were a holy priesthood. A holy nation. To offer sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That they were living stones. That they'd be the temple of God. This is what's in the scriptures. The apostle Paul answers this objection. Because seeing what their history and their heritage. And and how it was never enough. 
He says much in every way. He says there is an advantage. It means that something here is important. He, really, he reiterates what he had said from last week in Romans chapter 2, verse 25. That circumcision is indeed of value. He says to begin with. Or the Greek word here is proton. Which means first or primary. He says first, primarily. This is, by the way, the same word that our Lord used on the Sermon on the Mount. He says seek proton. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. It's the same exact word. Seek first. There's many things that could be said. And the Apostle Paul will say it in chapter 9 of this list of advantages. But he wants to know you first and foremost. This is the most important. That they had been entrusted with the oracles of God. God literally gave them. Uh, from his hand onto stone, his word, he entrusted it to him. And what's really interesting in this text, it is past tense. He entrusted that to him. The oracles of God. This is the word oracle means logos, a word. It's the Bible. He entrusted it to him. And by definition, this is what it means. It means to assign responsibility... For doing something. It also means to put into someone's care and protection. They were assigned the word of God to care for it, protect it, continue to teach it to generations. It was entrusted to them to honor it, to worship their God through it, and to relate to each other. They were entrusted with this. You know, I was thinking about, you know, if you're new here, one of the things that we do is we stand for the reading of the Word of God. And the reason why we do is He has entrusted the Word of God to us, and we want to show reverence for it. That's why we do it. We love the Word of God. But imagine, they were a people called by God to worship Him. They knew God. They could relate to God because of the word of God and to each other. But Paul is saying that there is an advantage in every way. But what he's saying, it's not enough. It's saying it's not enough just to go through the motions. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to go for them to go to synagogue and sin and sin and sin and live like God doesn't exist at all. There's no advantage to that. But there is an advantage that I want you to hear because it's an advantage for us. He's writing this to the Christian church and this dialogue is so important. There's a great advantage to have the word of God and to know him intimately. You know, there's a time in history where this Bible was not accessible to you at all. There was a time in history the ordinary person they said the plowman could not even read the Bible. What, you had, what they had to do is listen to someone speak and believe everything they're saying, but never having it themselves. And then God raised up people. Tinsdale, Wycliffe, their lives, they'd be killed for this. And they translated the Bible for the common man. Because the word was entrusted to God's people. This is important for us, that we could intimately know this God. We would know him. We would know what he desires. We would know how to respond on the horizontal to one another. And this is the same for the Christ follower. There is a great advantage for having the word of God, but it's not enough. You know... Think about this. Often we, you know, I love going to Teen Challenge and hearing the testimonies of what God is doing in the lives of these young men. And some of these stories are absolutely tragic. But what I want to say to you today, probably one of the greatest Christian testimonies 
that we could hear at a baptism is simply this. I was brought up in a home that loved God. We read the word together. I was introduced to God in my home. Oh, they revered the word. We, 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 we read together and they taught me, my family taught me my prayers and, and to get to know and to love God in the home. This is the greatest testimony that you could ever hear. And I, and I just commit to every one of you parents, this is the labor for us in your home. There's no greater testimony that your child could give. Yes, I praise God that God delivered men from addictions and other situations. I praise God for that. But I'll tell you, I praise God for moms and dads that are raising their children up to love God. It's the most important thing you can do. Their children, our children, it's a great advantage. It is an advantage in the sense that they know him from the most intimate and personal place in their life, their home. The Christian church has been entrusted as well with the word of God to teach it, to exhort it, to correct with it. But you know, what the Apostle Paul is saying is in the midst of this great advantage, it's not enough. Just because we go to church does not make us a Christian. Just because we go to a Bible study, it doesn't make us a Christ follower. The Apostle Paul wants to embark on answering these questions because it's not the outward actions that makes us anything. It's what God does inside us. The heart and changes our heart. He's saying it's not enough to be a physical descendant of Abraham. That you would know your tribe. But to be a spiritual descendant of Abraham through Jesus Christ. John 4, 23. I, I, I'm sure you remember when Jesus was speaking to the woman of the well. He says this in verse 23. The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship God. God's possession, by the way, the true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. See, this is not determined by heritage or history, but by the work of the Father. And yet, as moms and dads, as believers pass this knowledge on, there is an advantage, because the word of God has been entrusted to God's people. We can't be a Christian outward, just outwardly. We need to be one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart. Not by the spirit, not by the letter. This is the work of God. The father who initiated it. The son who accomplished it. And the Holy Spirit who applied it. So what advantage? Is there to be a Jew or circumcision? Much in every single way. Second, he talks about the advantage of God's faithfulness. It starts to go off the rails a little bit here in his explanation to them. Because some absurd things must have been being said. He says this in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. What if we are unfaithful? He begins this way. Does their faith, faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? And what I want you to see is what he begins with here as he's writing now from most, the most important place, the entrusted word of God. He, he now redirects the way that people are thinking, starting to think by the people. And I always tell people, if you want to get to the right end, start at the right beginning. He's, here he's writing intentionally from the wrong place. He says, what if some were unfaithful? He's talking about people. He's not talking about God. He's talking about, well, we've already read the history of Israel. We know that they were unfaithful. And, and he says, does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? What are they talking about? They're talking about, is God going to keep his promise? Is God going to keep his covenant? He answers this way, by no means. Will it nullify the faithfulness of God? He says, let God be true, though everyone else is a liar. 
as it written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you're judged. You know, this text is really something that's addressing uh, some accusations that were made against the Apostle Paul. One is antinomianism, and this is what that would believe. It would believe, and antinomianism believes in just fully this grace card. Remember, we've talked about it before, living like, hey, we don't believe, but we just trust in this grace card. Meaning there has to be no act of obedience in someone. It's just grace, grace, grace. In fact, you have, they would teach, the first teaches this, says you have a license to sin. Jesus went to the cross, you're, you're all set. You have a license to sin. And you don't need to repent. Now, that would go against Scripture so hard where it says repent and believe, right? And, and so they were charging him with this. They were, people were saying, I don't think he is who he is. And when they're starting talking about this, he's really speaking about the attributes of God. He really wants to bring out that God is sovereign in salvation, and he's immutable in character, meaning he's unchangeable. He is absolutely unchangeable in his thought. He cannot change. In fact, Hebrews 6, 18, 19 says, it's impossible for God to lie. So what he's trying to say, the measurement of God's faithfulness should never be measured against man. God never breaks his covenant he is a covenant keeper. He is just and will not change. He won't diminish his holiness, his majesty, his infinite transcendence for anyone. Not for you, not for me, not for anyone. He isn't changed. Will God become faithlessness? Because we are? No. By no means, the apostle says. God is sovereign, and it's his plan. I love when he writes to Paul, writes the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian church in chapter 2, and we sang much of it this morning, verses 8 through 10. For by grace, God's work, you have been saved. And notice this, past tense again, you have been saved. Through faith, this is not of your own doing. This is God's doing, is what he's trying to say. It is a gift from God, not a result of your works, not a result by how many rituals you went through or how many sacraments you went through. No, it's not a result of any works that no one would boast. Then he goes on to say this, and a lot of times people just run right by this scripture, for we are his workmanship. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the new creation. He said you were dead. I made you alive. Just like he formed Adam, he formed you. He, you're his workmanship, it says. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Friday night I shared with the men here, uh, 2, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 8, B, and 9. And it was to share in the sufferings for the gospel by the power of God who saved us. This is interesting. Who saved us and called us. He saved you from the wrath of God. He called you to himself. And he says to Timothy, a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. We can say like Paul, does God change? By no means. Will he become faithlessness because I'm so bad? By no means. We don't need to carry the guilt and the shame because it was placed on the cross on Christ. That's what he's saying, by no means. In fact, God took it from you and put it on his son. And this is why we celebrate this week and hold it to high esteem. Here's the thing. Are we to live in such a way 
that would put this to the test? Should we live faithlessly to see if God will be faithful? Amen. But a lot of people live that way. Because they may be antinomianism, and they don't even know it. They might not even know what that word means. But then what they're going to do is just going to live with a grace card. I don't care. I'm just going to live. And at the end of it, hopefully God will be faithful. What we will experience if we live this way is the justice of the one true God. He is this, that God would be justified in his words. And God will prevail when you are judged. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us to examine ourselves to see whether you're in the faith. I love church history. You know this. And one of my heroes, besides the biblical hero, hero Josiah, the young Josiah, is I love George Whitfield. He was closed out of his church for preaching the gospel. So he hopped on a, plan, uh, on a boat. Yeah, a plane. It wasn't even around then. Um, and he came to the United States, and he became one of the greatest open-air preachers of our time. He hopped on a horse, and he went all down the East Coast, all the way to Georgia, all the way back up to New England, and preached the gospel. They said he preached to more people in Boston than lived in Boston. And what I was amazed, it has to be the work of the Holy Spirit, because how the heck could the people in the back even hear it? They didn't have amplifiers. Ah, the Holy Spirit. This is what he said. This is a quote from George Whitfield himself. A true faith. And Jesus Christ will not suffer us to be idle. No. It's an active, lively, restless principle. It fills the heart that it cannot be easily, easy till and, until it's doing something for Jesus Christ. That he stirs in us. See, the new affection does not desire to test, but attest to the grace and mercy of a faithful God. Then he goes on to say the advantage of God's righteousness. Again, it's going to almost absurdity here. Romans 3, 5 and 6. But how about if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God? Now, these are not the questions of the Apostle Paul. Paul, Paul is raising these questions because it's on the hearts and mind of people. What if I were unrighteous? Okay. You're saying if we're unfaithful, God will always be faithful. Yes. But how about if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God? What shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. The Apostle Paul once again. And again, emphatic things. I always tell you, write them down. And remember, by no means. He says it again. For then how could God judge the world if he was unrighteous? By no means, he says. See, we're drifting further and further away from the cross to a point where it might even be a little ridiculous. We're contemplating the scriptures from the wrong direction. Us, our unfaithfulness, our unrighteousness. That in some way, could we live so unrighteously that God would work his righteousness out. So if I live against God, will eventually God prevail once again? And if so, how could God condemn us? How, how could he do this? I loved Bobby's title to the message last week, False Assurance. Because I'll say this, write this down. False claims on God will lead you to false assurances in God. False claims of God will lead you to false assurances of God. And listen, who could have made this claim better in Scripture than Judas Iscariot? Judas committed suicide. He had his time in front of God. What would he say? God, how can you condemn me? If it wasn't for me, Jesus wouldn't be on the cross. If it wasn't for me, he wouldn't have been crucified. What can, why would you do anything to me? 
If anybody could say these things, it would be Judas Iscariot. But I'd say is this. If any of us in this room are thinking this way this morning, I would say you need to read the Bible because there's a great ignorance of the Scripture. First, I want to say this to you. You would ignore the covenant of redemption. That's the covenant between the Godhead itself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The cross was not a decision of man by Judas, but the destiny and the instrument of God's purpose. It was already done in the Godhead. It wasn't done by Judas. Second, the Gospels tell us when we read this about Judas that Satan had entered Judas. This tells us that Judas was not a believer. He was not a hero, as he might see himself. Satan could not inhibit the temple of God. God cast him out of the temple in the heaven. He, there's no way Satan, Satan can play with you, Satan could influence you, but he cannot inhabit you. You are inhabited by the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of God, the temple of God, and there is no way. Judas is not a hero by any means. Third, the righteousness of God. To be made right with God was sovereignly acquired through his son, not through Judas. The spotless lamb of God. The gospel provides more than forgiveness for us, which is the removal of the penalty of sin. It also declares for you the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be credited to the one who believes in him. And this is a divine act of God. Justification by faith, by which God declares the believer to be righteous before him. What does that mean? When you stand before the Lord, and you will, and he'll ask you to give you account, what do you think he'd be asking you? What have you done with what I have entrusted you with? What have you done with it? Did you bury the miner for yourself? What did you do with it? What would Judas say? Well, I got 30 shekels of silver. I turned the Savior in. I made sure he got crucified. That wasn't going to help him. This is a divine act of God. It's called the doctrine of imputation. What does this mean? It means this. In fact, it's double, that God would take our sin, the sin of the world, and impute it into the one who knew no sin, the perfect lamb. On the day of atonement, he imputed it to his son, and the same action of God crucifying it, the shedding of blood, he imputed the righteousness of Christ to you. It's part of your entrustment, by the way. Know this, that this is an irrevocable act of God, accredited to the repentant believer. Romans 1.17, if you remember that, for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And we know that we'll be reading shortly in Romans 3.22 through 23, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. God shows no partiality. For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means we all need the power of God. We all need the work of Jesus Christ. We need the redemption of our sin, the imputed righteousness of God to stand before him. What advantage if we're unrighteous? That's a testimony against God. Because you're only right in Christ. God will see as you appear before him. He will see his son. And his son has set you free. And he will say, come, enter my good 
and faithful servant. That's the promise for you. And then he talks about the advantage of God's glory. Romans 3, 7, 8, it's a lot of the same. That How about my lie? That God's truth would abound in his glory. Why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good might come? You know, if anybody has taken um, the Behold Your God with us and know that they come into this section of teaching and they say there's a couple of different types of Christians. One is the isolationist. Protect yourself from the world. Build yourself a little fort. And then the other one was the young and the restless. And the young and the restless isn't determined. They're not talking about age. They're talking about the Christian that wants to live so close to the precipice of sin. So close. And I tell you, that's dangerous. Why would we want to do evil in our life so we could build a testimony? The testimony is simply this, that Jesus Christ died for your sin, went to the cross, and we're going to celebrate this all week. That is what it's about. That's your testimony. And God gave his righteousness to you that you could stand before a holy God. See, this is showing us the depravity of man. And the depravity of man leads to contempt. As a result of all this, Paul, it says at the very end of this that he was being slandered. He was actually being slandered. Do you know what this means? This is an action of a crime of someone making, speaking falsely against someone, damaging a person's reputation. This is what they were trying to do. Stop the word of God. Guess what? No one can stop the word of God. Nobody. The United States of America can't. China can't. Russia can't. Massachusetts can't. New England can't. Nobody can stop this word because God's glory is going to be made known regardless. And remember all these things that this also happened to our Lord. Remember, they accused him of blasphemy. Being disrespectful to God. Matthew 26, verse 65. He was accused of violating the law. Remember the Sabbath. Matthew 12, 1 through 21. All these accusations. False accusations. He was accused of being a rebel. Remember, the Pharisees told the, uh, Pontius Pilate that he was telling them not to pay taxes. All these faults to draw them down. Do you know people, there are people that will put you down for only one reason that they may be raised up. See, Jesus had power. The Pharisees were jealous. It could, it's going to happen to you. Oh. So how to, as we get ready to share the Lord's Supper, I have just a couple of questions. Let's look at this as an application. What do we do with texts like this? What I'd say is don't get ridiculous with God's word and start at the right point. Start at the point of God. Know God. Know who he is. And then we can judge ourselves for it. No one has to tell me when I'm sinful. But don't start with man. Second is, what will you do with what you have been entrusted with? You've been entrusted with the gospel. God saved you by his power. He called you with his voice. You've been entrusted with the word of God to pass it on to generations. It doesn't matter what family you came from or what your past was or what church you attend. What are you going to do with what you've been entrusted with? And here's probably the most of all, your testimony. Do not live the sinful life to produce a greater testimony. Our outward actions are not enough the divine work of the Holy Spirit to live under Christ and through Christ. The old is gone and the new has come. The new creation with new affections. That's our prayer. And that he would lead us constantly because we are in the body of flesh. He would lead us to repentance of our sin. An unrepentant sinner is a sure mark that they're not a Christian at all. 
So let's pray and let's prepare as we remember all the, what the Lord has done for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message and the gospel. We thank you for the divine work of your only begotten Son, that you sent him from the glories of heaven, from the heavenly tabernacle, born of a virgin, to be, as John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God who come to take away the sin of the world, to be the atonement of our sin, that he'd even do more and carry it away from as far as the east is from the west. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning as we sit under your word and listen. Lord, maybe someone here, Heavenly Father, is at that place saying, you know, that's me. I've lived that way. I, I've, I've lived in such a manner that even though I believe in God, I've lived like I don't believe in God. Heavenly Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead them to repentance this morning. I pray for the one that might not know you, that don't know you intimately, that doesn't have the oracles of God. And it's like Ezekiel did. He actually ate the word of God, Has, doesn't have it in them. I pray, Heavenly Father, we know this is your work. We ask and pray, Heavenly Father, in your name, that the Holy Spirit would bring a lumen and bring it into them. Heavenly Father, that they could come to that place of saving faith. So, Lord, we pray all these things in confidence, God, because we know that you are the covenant keeper. You are the way maker. You are our everything. You are our hope, and you are our future. So we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as the ushers pass out the elements this morning,